All right. Good morning. It is September 16th, and this is Senate Health and Welfare. Uh, we have uh, a small committee this morning because uh, appropriations is meeting, but uh, we, we will go through some of the budget policy language that uh, is in our jurisdiction and so that we can better understand what's there and then perhaps make a, a recommendation. Um, for those of you who are not here, but out listening and looking in on the committee, if anyone is there, uh, we, won't, we won't be spending the entire morning. Uh, we'll work with Katie McClinn and Nolan Langwell and on the budget policy language and then um, have our, our short discussion and call it a day. So Katie, thank, thanks for being here. And I know you had said that there were sections of the big bill that contain um, mental health uh, embedding in police and some of those issues that we have looked at. Um, also the CCFAP uh, rate information and we will have Commissioner Brown in tomorrow on that so we can talk about whether or not you wanna go through that this morning. So, okay, let me, I'm working to pull up the document right now. All right, great. There we go. Okay, Thank you. this is section E314.2 of the budget. And this is the language that House Healthcare most recently worked on um, with regard to the proposal that originally had 525,000 going to DPS versus mental health. So as we discussed yesterday, um, healthcare made the decision to have the funds go to mental health. And as you saw in the memo that um, that committee wrote, um, the rationale behind that decision was that um, mental health crises are a healthcare issue and not, um, and therefore should be um, funded through um, the Department of Mental Health. So you'll see that um, the money is going to DMH for fiscal year 2021 and that DMH is to collaborate with um, DPS and other stakeholders, including individuals with lived experience of a mental health condition or psychiatric disability, and those whose identities cause them to experience additional marginalization and expanding regional models that strengthen partnerships between law enforcement, mental health, and social services through clinical staff positions that address crisis response to mental health emergencies. So that, that this is what the money is being used for. So we're, we're um, kind of braiding together um, response to mental health crises through a law enforcement, mental health and social service lens and um, looking at doing that through um, clinical staff positions to address crises. The purpose of the so, program is- to question. Sorry. No, please. Can I, is it, um, I think we should ask questions as we go along because we didn't memorize the memo um, yet. <laughs> um, and, Next uh, to my list. <laughs> <laughs> but my question is this, in the discussion that went on in the house or this, does this language direct the Department of Mental Health to be responsible for determining which regional programs or how is that being sorted out? Is that something that's happening through the MOU with public safety? Why don't we look at the rest of the language? Okay. Um, if that's okay with you. I, I think that, nope, that that's good. Um, and, and then we can, if it's not addressed, remind me again and we can circle back. But I think the rest of the language might help to fill in some of the gaps. Okay. Um, so this goes on to say that the purpose is to enhance the statewide response to um, crisis, reducing involvement of law enforcement when those supports are not necessary for public safety and ensuring strong, strong coordination when those supports are necessary. So again, um, just a recognition that um, public safety supports are not always the ideal um, supports to address the mental health crises, um, but there are circumstances when those supports are necessary. And it goes on to say that this, um, the purpose of the program is also to improve access to services and supports for um, mental health needs in the community. And then um, in subdivision two, 
Um, it gives some direction that to the extent possible in hiring individuals to carry out the section, DAs and SSAs providing the services shall give priority to qualified individuals with lived experience. So um, in this section, we learn that it's the DAs and SSAs that are doing the hiring and how they're supposed to prioritize their hiring. In subsection B, this is um, a status update. So by November 15th of this year, um, both departments of mental health and public safety together to provide a status report to the health reform committee and joint legislative justice oversight committee on plans for implementing the program. And this is what specifically that status update will include. You'll see on line 10 subdivision one, this is the MOU. So we don't know ex exactly what the MOU will look like yet. So this is asking for that on November 15th what's in the MOU and with the DAs and the SSAs, what does that look like? Um, in subdivision two, the partners and stakeholders involved in planning the program, so who's at the table? In subdivision three, the geographic locations identified for new clinical staff resource coverage. And in subdivision four, the physical location for planned staffing. So if you remember our conversation yesterday in the memo that we went over, um, there was a recognition in healthcare's memo that this issue of how to address mental health crises is twofold. There needs to be some work moving forward on how to reimagine what the system could look like. Um, and so that is where subsection C comes in. So far, we've been looking at what's happening for this budget cycle. But subsection C kind of turns to the future and um, ask the Department of Mental Health to coordinate further development of a cohesive statewide approach to mental health emergencies and emergency calls under the leadership of impacted communities in collaboration with the Department of Public Safety, the DAs and SSAs, the Department of Mental Health Standing Committees for Adult and Children's Mental Health, and that in doing this, the approach would be consistent with the 10-year vision that this com um, committee received a presentation on earlier in the year. And then there's a report back on March 15th, 2021. Um, the department is to report on its progress in developing a statewide approach to mental health emergencies and share that with this committee in house health care. Okay. So All right. questions. go ahead. I was just going to say in terms of your question, is, is there any specificity as to what is in the MOU? Um, there's not a great deal of specificity. It's sort of leaving it up to the Department of Mental Health and all of the stakeholders listed to figure out what the right um, framework and where the needs are. Um, in terms of specificity, we, we do know that there's priority given to individuals with mental illness and that we're looking for involvement from a wide range of stakeholders. We're looking to cover um, geographic locations throughout the state. Um, but besides that, there is an, um, an, a lot of specificity as to the requirements of what the MOU must contain. In some ways that's probably beneficial to um, Department of Mental Health and public, the public safety. Uh, on the other hand, I don't know, uh, questions for Katie on this. I'm doing some thinking right now. Any thoughts? Well, it's very, I mean, it's left up to them to really do on the fly almost, isn't it? Um, that's, um, but I don't know if we well, should Well, I think, them. yeah, I, you know, the, the thing sure. is that municipal, right there. Go ahead, Senator, sorry to interrupt. No, I'm sorry. I just, I don't know if we should uh, try to provide more direction or not. I mean, maybe it does need to be done more at the grassroots level, you know, as they're seeing what the, what evolves. Uh, so when Katie, when you talk about the stakeholders involved in working on the MOU, that is really uh, the people in charge are DMH and public safety. And then they look to partners and stakeholders to complete their work and to produce an MOU. Is that accurate? 
the grouping is, um, it's beyond just DMH and public safety. Um, starting okay. on lines 10 and 11, but um, so their stakeholders, including individuals with lived experience um, and those whose identities cause them to experience marginalization. Um, so um, it, it is casting a wide net to pull in, to pull in a bigger group of people than just folks from the administration and the two departments. Well, as I think about what's actually happening in our municipalities, their municipal government and local police have been very much engaged, but this is more about state police. And so the models that are out there are models that have been developed locally, either between a hospital and a Howard Center or other uh, uh, organization similar like Washington County Mental Health. So th those organizations are already working on some collaboration and they have some expertise in how response takes place. Um, is there anything in here? Well, it does have them go scroll down, I think. It does have them look at um, current models, right, in the state? No. These are the things that the yeah. um, report back, the report back includes the MOU, partners and stakeholders, geographic locations, and um, physical location for the plan staff. Huh. I mean, for me, it's see, I, what, what would, who? Huh. It may be that the state police can link in with a current program and that the current program can simply, simply be expanded to cover state police calls in a specific region. So I guess that's the thing I'm thinking about. We already have some ongoing programs and they're very, they've been proven to be extremely uh, good and, and uh, effective. Am I making sense, committee? I, I mean, do we do we want to step into this or uh, with some kind of single line about um, core, uh, possible coordination with current um, programs? That makes sense. I mean, Department of Health to further development of a cohesive state. That it talks about as cohesive statewide and impacted communities. That 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 gets to that Senator Cummings. I think we're stepping into the area of micromanaging. Uh -huh. um, I think that people involved in this work together now. They know they can do this. They don't need us to tell them to look at successful local programs. And I think if we let them work it out on their own, um, <laughs> I think we have to trust them at some point. Well, I'm with you on that. My concern is that we don't develop parallel systems all over the state. That, that's my only concern. And I, I agree with you that the, the DMH and public safety are perfectly capable of diving into this, but um, sometimes things take on a life of their own. And maybe that's, see, maybe that's the next step, the statewide approach. So. This line 18 does say under the leadership of impacted communities. Um, yep. So that sort of implies that <laughs> communities where there are already existing programs. Yes, and, and it will fit in with the Department of Mental Health's 10-year uh, plan. So mm -hmm. I'm just trying to make sure we're not leaving something out. I, I have no interest in uh, doing this work. <laughs> but I do have an interest in ensuring that what's here is going to won't lead to um, problems later on. OK. The other question that we probably should answer is going back up to the money. Um, 
who gets the money and who administers it. And uh, I think there might, I, we heard a strong uh, recommendation from Mike Sherling that the public safety needs resources and that they could do the work if they had the resources. But I, I of course, we're Committee on Health and Welfare. So I lean toward the comments that are here by the healthcare committee that this is a healthcare issue and the money should flow through the Department of Mental Health. As the money flows through the Department of Mental Health, Katie, does that do anything to detract from uh, what's available for the program itself? I mean, is it gonna take money Are you to asking? administer? Will, will it take money? Yeah. You're asking uh, if it know. takes money from an existing program? I'm, I'm not the money person. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, no, the $525,000 will go for boots on the ground. That's it, right? It'll go. I believe to, so. Go. I believe it's to hire additional clinical staff. Okay. Okay. All right. Any questions on that section? I'm asking Senator Cummings and Senator Ingram, do you agree with this iteration that um, the money should flow through the Department of Mental Health because we're looking at a health care issue. Uh, I, you know, I actually feel quite strongly about that. I think that's where the money should go, for sure. And any, are you OK oh, with that? Fine. Yeah, OK. I, I feel that way, too. OK. Hey, Senator uh, Lyons? Yes. Um, is your intent to review this language and make a recommendation to the Appropriations Committee about this? Yes. Okay. And and do they know you're doing this because they're blasting through the, the budget? Right I'm now. sure that I'm sure that they um, are not. Oh, well, yes, uh, Senator Westman and Senator McCormick should be aware of this. I'm just um, making sure that everybody's on the same page. That there's an understanding. In yeah. The, well, I'm. Yes, you're right. Nail, They'll say, okay, we're going to wait for the recommendation from the committee before we move on this versus they may. They be... won't. Okay. I'm just making they sure won't. we're all coordinated. Well, thank you. Oh, no. Thank you for that. I will be in contact with Senator Kitchell. I did not realize that they were meeting this morning. Otherwise, that would have happened yesterday. Well. I'm not sure if they knew they were going to meet this morning. I just know that they're on an accelerated timeline and they're trying to get it out. Um, so I don't know that they knew they were going to be today either. Okay. Are we going to be finished this week? <laughs> well, the so next week is the last week. So in theory, you want to get the budget out this week to give time for floor and conference and whatever. Well, we have bills that the house has to act on. So if yeah. they send us any of our bills back, that would be nice. So. Oh, uh, I think uh, next week, yeah, Senator. Excuse me. Um, I just wanted to, that reminds me that I did get an update from our uh, house colleague yesterday about on the H663. They have been told they're not going to, it's not going to the floor in the house. So we, will not be seeing, we will not be seeing it. They have been told apparently by their leadership that they only want to pass things that are emergency or related or directly related to COVID. So no, no contraceptives in the schools or wellness or menstrual products. I've heard that as well. Okay. All right. Anything else on uh, Katie? Is there anything else in the budget that we should look at? Would you like to look at the CC FAP language or you're doing that with Sarah Penn? I think we are tomorrow, but it, um, oh. is there is there is there something we can look at? Can you just briefly oh, take no. us yep. through that? Yeah, not long. I think we should be able to finish relatively quickly. Oh, all right. That was the healthcare version. That wasn't the whole. Hold on, I'm gonna stop share. Okay. I'm gonna try to find the correct document.
There we go. Okay, take two. There we go. Okay. So the next section in the budget is E318, and this is the child care provider stabilization grants. Um, and this is 800,000 allocated to expanding infant and toddler capacity. Um, it gives the division of the child development division the authority to award grants to eligible applicants. And then it goes on to define what an eligible applicant is. Um, it can be a new or existing regulated privately owned center-based program or family child care home that's in good standing. Um, the um, program that participates in CCFAP that provides year-round full-day child care and early learning services, provides child care and early learning services for infants and toddlers, and the program participates in STARS. And then in subsection C, there's language that center-based programs and family child care homes that receive a grant under this section must remain in compliance with the division's rules, continue participating in STARS, and maintain enrollment of children uh, supported by CCFAP. So once you get the grant, you um, continue to um, comport with the eligibility requirements. Next okay. um, is language pertaining to CCFAP. Um, this um, states that um, DCF is to align CCFAP eligibility with the current federal poverty guidelines. And um, DCF is to align rates of reimbursement for preschool and school age children participating in CCFAP in fiscal year 2021 with market rates reported on the 2015 market rate survey. So bringing school age and preschool rates up to the 2015 survey and then maintain rates of reimbursement for infants and toddlers participating in CCFAP um, in fiscal year 2021 aligned with market rates reported on the 2017 survey. Okay, so we're, and we're gonna hear about this tomorrow. How does this change what we did? I'm trying- <laughs> On the market, I'm trying question. to remember. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what the rates were. So this says um, maintain rates of reimbursement for infants and toddlers to 2017. So that leads me to believe that when- That's you what we did child care bill last year, you must have done 2017. Yeah. And the fact that you're moving preschool and children um, to 2015, uh, it makes me wonder if it was 2014 last year. Don't quote me on that. I have to go back to the bill and yeah. see where it changed so many times in so many different versions. I can't remember where the numbers finally landed. Um, right. I think we've had emails about this, but we'll, you know, we'll Thank you for looking. <laughs> yeah, the emails have to do with, um, so yeah. the market rate survey is done every other year. Um, and so this is asking um, for like an interim market rate survey to see right. how COVID has affected the market rates. Yeah. And then if you remember, um, the child care rules changed um, two or three years ago. Um, and there was language and a lot of discussion uh, last year and two years ago about creating a variance for child care providers who have been working for a certain number of years. So this um, language continues that um, individuals that are operating or employed in a registered family child care home or as a director or teacher associate at a center-based program for 10 or more years prior to support. September 1st, 2016. Um, this allows the commissioner to issue a variance to the division's rules regarding the education experiential requirements allowed to maintain employment in the same role, um, regardless of whether the provider, um, assistant, director, or teacher associate intends to attain otherwise necessary educational requirements. It goes on to have eligibility for the um, variance the person has to work continuously in a regulated program with a full license and good standing and meet the division's educational experiential requirements that were in place as of September 1st, 2016. And um, the commissioner 
has the authority to review any violation occurring in a regulated program where a family child care provider, the child care assistant director or teacher associate is under variance and may revoke the variance granted depending on the seriousness or circumstances of a violation. And any variance granted under the section is to be terminated on July 1, 2024. And extensions cannot be granted beyond that date. And then um, there's language on general assistance, which I'm not familiar with. Um, so that's the end of the child care. Section. This looks like it, it looks like it's also related to COVID in some way. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Uh, looks like it. I think this is the, um, well, it's temporary housing in catastrophic situations for vulnerable populations. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that that's necessarily COVID re related. Um, no, but it, it's by the temporary extreme housing weather, for right. weather. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think okay. Um, my guess is that is the language that we've been seeing um, the past few years in the budget around um, GA housing. Okay, I'm gonna okay. stop the share. There we go. All right, questions for Katie. That's good. I, we, we'll, we're gonna dive into some um, budget stuff tomorrow and we're, also, we're looking at stabilization uh, funding and how that's going. So we'll maybe we'll be able to ask some questions then if we have them on this, okay. Anything else, Senator Ingram, Senator Cummings? So is it, it's your understanding that we'll be able to do uh, H611 today on the floor? That's the- uh, uh, you know, the I, I sent the that email to uh, Senator Ash mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I don't know that I, I don't know whether I've heard back. I did not hear back late last night and I haven't looked thoroughly at my email since about seven o'clock this morning. So I don't know. Um, okay. Well, I'll be ready. I'll be ready. I'll, I'll be yeah. Ready. So when so, they're it's here tomorrow. So I know that we've got we've got 795 is coming up. I know that we've got the uh, Act 250 bill and I there's another bill 354 I think um, on hazard pay. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got those bills. And then depending on how everyone's feeling, it would be good to get 611 across the, across to the house, back to the house. They're very anxious to have it. So it's interesting that we've gotten all of our work done on all of their bills and sent them over. We haven't seen one of our bills come back really. Yes, this is, <laughs> this is something we remark on in Senate education all the time. Well, you know, it, su move, it suggests to me that we're going to slow down next time. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, not really. We get our work done. Yeah. All right. Committee, is there anything else that we need to do today? Okay. I'm thinking that um, after tomorrow, our week next week is going to be pretty light unless we see something coming back to us. What I'm going to do is um, I'll work with Nellie and just schedule some committee time on uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Keep your ears open for Tuesday. We won't schedule anything for Tuesday next, but uh, unless we need to, if there are amendments or things like that, that we need to pay attention to. But we'll set a committee schedule for Wednesday and Thursday with committee discussion in place and then see what comes up and we may or may not meet those days. How's that? And that that's how you're you're muted, Senator Cummings. I will only be here for a short while, if that long tomorrow. Tomorrow have we have joint meeting with the House in the Okay, beginning. so you won't miss me. Okay. I will miss you greatly. <laughs> we will miss you. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Does that sound good? Like a plan? 
Uh, I'm going to suggest this, um, Nellie, I'm going to suggest that we um, go off live and that if you and Katie and Nolan can stick around, we'll do a quick agenda planning meeting and then that'll be it. Thank you both. Thank you.